Stephen was stoned for blasphemy, there was a young man named Saul who not only witnessed it, but approved of it. And after Stephen's death, a great persecution broke out against the church. And Saul went door to door, taking, dragging believers out as prisoners. And the believers began to flee to Judea and Samaria. But with the scattering of the believers came the spreading of the gospel. And so our story today comes from Acts 9, the road to Damascus. Meanwhile, Paul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the chief priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found anyone that belonged to the way, he might take them as prisoners back to Jerusalem, whether they be man or woman. And as he was approaching Damascus, On his journey, suddenly this bright light from heaven came and surrounded him, and he fell to the ground. He heard a voice say, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? He replied, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what to do. Now the men that were traveling with Saul stood speechless. They had heard a sound, but they didn't see anyone. And when Saul got up, he opened his eyes, and he saw nothing. So they had to guide him by the hand into Damascus. And for three days he was blind, and he did not eat or drink anything. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord came to him in a vision and said, Ananias, yes, Lord, he said. I want you to go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus whose name is Saul, for he is there praying. He has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him, to restore his sight. Lord, said Ananias, I have heard reports about the harm that this man has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And now he has authority from the chief priest to arrest all of those who call on your name. But the Lord said, go. For this man is my instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and all the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. So Ananias went to the house and he entered it and placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord has sent me here, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road. He has sent me here so that you may see again and receive the Holy Spirit. And immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes. And he got up and he was baptized. And after eating some food, he regained his strength. Now Saul spent several days in Damascus with the disciples. And immediately he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed, saying, Isn't this the man that raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who called upon this name? And hasn't he come here to take prisoners to Jerusalem? Yet Paul became more and more powerful And he baffled the Jews in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. God's word for God's people. I choose to give the sermon here from this pulpit rather than the beautiful stand that Pastor Chris uses because I'm a leaner. And if you still have that image from last week of Pastor Chris laying over that drum, flapping his arms and legs, 
You do not want to add to it me tumbling down these steps. It wouldn't be pretty. On the road to Damascus, Saul, later known as Paul, his world was turned upside down. This encounter with Jesus was the beginning of transforming him from the most dangerous destroyer of the church to probably the greatest Christian missionary of all time. In today's scripture, we hear that Saul was still breathing out murderous threats. You see, his whole life was consumed with a passion to purify the Jewish tribe of all those who believed in this messianic imposter called Jesus. Why? They were committing blasphemy against his God. And he didn't want to just contain it or drive it out of Jerusalem. He wanted to rid the earth of it. Saul was a man to be feared. And no one knows for sure what route Saul took to Damascus, but most agree it was probably the northern route which took him through the mountains of Samaria which probably only added fuel to the fire, for there were reports that Samaritans were turning to Jesus by the thousands. And as he was nearing Damascus, suddenly this bright light surrounds him. Now, there are different schools of thought as to what this light was and what exactly happened on the road to Damascus, but this is what I have concluded. Judaism thought of God as revealed in the Shani... Shekinah glory, that is, the presence of God on earth. Saul was a very learned man of the Old Testament. He knew about his forefathers encountering God's glory. And Saul had this light surround him, and he falls to the ground, and he hears a voice, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And to a Pharisee, and Saul was one, A voice from heaven was the voice of God, especially when it was accompanied by a blinding glory. Saul's confused. How could he be persecuting his God when his whole life was given to his service? Saul didn't recognize this voice then as being Jesus. Saul wasn't one of the flock, and it is the sheep that recognized the shepherd's voice. When the Lord called to Ananias, he replied, Yes, Lord. But when he called to Paul, he questioned, Who are you, Lord? And the answer came, I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. And that is when Saul's whole world was turned upside down. Jesus was alive. He had risen just as Stephen and the believers had said. He is here. And everything that Saul had believed was shattered. He must have been sick at heart when he realized that his whole life was in opposition to the God that he worshipped. Yes, his world was turned upside down, as so can ours be. Eighteen years ago, when my husband and I had been married for 26 years, Valentine's Day was approaching. And I just happened to notice three cards he had bought laying on his front seat of his car. Yes, I peeped. And the first one read, to my mother on Valentine's Day, and the second to my wife on Valentine's Day. And then there was a third card, to the woman I love. Hmm, That's strange, I thought. But then I told myself that the card to my wife was funny, and the one to the woman I love was pretty soppy, so he was probably sending me both cards. What a guy. And then Valentine's Day came, and I opened the card to my wife, pretending that I had never seen it. And I looked around, and I didn't see any other cards. We missing anything here, I asked. No, was his reply. And then it started with a little stab in my heart. And then my mind began to question, who did he send that card to? To the woman I love. And the more I molded over in my mind, the the greater my imagination grew. And it didn't help that in those days I was an avid soap opera fan, so all sorts of scenarios (laughs) began to play in my mind. Until after a few days I was convinced my husband was having an affair. Well, I was going to be gone a few days on an Emmaus walk, so I decided to clear the air and confess to him that I had seen those three cards. Maybe he had just forgotten, and and he'd say, oh, 
But instead, he got that stunned look on his face. The look I recognized is, how do I get out of this one? And he said, I don't want to discuss this right now. Men, you never say that to a woman. <laughs> I went a bit ballistic, and I accused him of having an affair, which he denied. And I demanded to know who he had sent that card to. And his response was, I'm not going to discuss this right now. We will talk about it when you get back. Trust me. Trust him? <laughs> then my mind shifted into overdrive, and emotions began to overwhelm me. Anger, hurt, resentment, and betrayal. And my thoughts kept feeding my emotions. And by the time I left for Emmaus to trust him, I was partially broken and partially wondering if I should even care. I was also a very stubborn woman back then. And the Emmaus walk was truly inspiring, and I began to feel the love of God, and as the weekend began to come to an end, my focus began to shift on going back home with a sense of dread. But I believed that God and I together could handle whatever was awaiting me. And then someone handed me an envelope, and there it was, the card to the woman I love. Now I think about that card not as a reminder that my husband loves me, I know that, but as a reminder of what your thoughts can do to your heart, what it can do to your soul. For the thoughts that we put in our minds can be a powerful weapon that can either work for us or it can work against us. No wonder scripture tells us, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. It is true that God accepts us just as we are, but he loves us too much to just leave us that way. His desire is to transform us to be like Jesus. In transformation, there becomes a change in our beliefs, which leads to a change in our behavior. Our passion for God and a genuine passion, compassion for others grows but we cannot change in our own power. If we could, we would have done so, and all those resolutions we have made year after year after year would have never been broken. An orchardist cannot cause the fruit to grow, but he can create conditions favorable for its growth. In the same way, we cannot cause God's character to grow in us, but we can create favorable conditions. So what is it that we need to do to create these? First, we need to submit to God. We need to be willing for God to transform us. We need to be willing to be Christ-like. This means not conforming to the world, as Romans 12, 2 tells us. Now, you've heard the statement, you are what you think. If you are thinking worldly thoughts, your actions will be of this world. We need to study and apply his word. Christians seem to grow faster and deeper in small groups. They study together, they pray together, they serve together, they challenge one another. And as our thinking changes, our decisions and our actions will change to conform to the mind of Christ. Transformation is an ongoing process, and at times we may find our world turning upside down, for it can be a very humbling experience. It must have been quite humbling for Saul to be blinded and have to be led into Damascus, not the entrance that he had anticipated. And it must have been humbling when Ananias placed his hands on him to restore his sight. Ananias, where a man only three days ago he would have dragged from his house as a prisoner. Throughout his ministry, Saul was humbled by the thoughts of what he had done to the followers of Christ. Indeed, he suffered as the Lord told Ananias, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. He met violent opposition and had a taste of persecution that he would face all his life. The hunter had become the hunted. And it was especially difficult to be a Christian in those days. But don't let anyone tell you that the Bible and its stories are not relevant to today. Six weeks ago, 60 Minutes ran a segment on Christianity in Iraq. In the past 10 months, ISIS has forced 125,000 Christians to flee their homes. 
They took control of the second largest city in Iraq, Mosul, last summer. They destroyed all signs and symbols of Christianity. They had their own sign of the Arabic letter N, which stood for Nasrani, the word for Christian, that was used to mark Christian homes. And when your home was marked with this sign, you had three choices. Convert to radical Islam, pay a huge extortion tax, or be executed. Paying extortion tax may keep you from being executed, but you were required to wear certain clothes so that you would be labeled as inferior and treated as such. The goal, to erase Christianity from the world. ISIS is breathing murderous threats. Sound familiar? Paul, when he used to be Saul. As I was preparing this message, I thought of what Jesus taught. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And I wondered when Saul was going house to house arresting believers on his, and on his way to Damascus, did any of the believers pray for him? And now Christians are being executed by ISIS. And we pray for those Christians on the other side of the world, but do we pray for ISIS? It is difficult to pray for enemies such as this, but Jesus taught it. He did it. And he could still change lives. And if you think what is happening is not close to home, in March, ISIS put on YouTube the pictures, names, addresses, and phone numbers of some of our military with orders that anyone in the USA belonging to ISIS should hunt them down. Lately in the news, we are hearing reports of those who are leaving our country to be trained and coming back with plans of terror. In the world today, every five minutes, a Christian dies for their faith. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. As Pastor Chris has been telling us, Jesus gives us some hard lines, and this is one of them. We can pray that Jesus might seek them out so that they might have a transformation like Saul, that their eyes may be opened and their direction changed. Can you imagine if a leading ISIS militant was converted to the gospel? And if we have anyone in our lives that we consider our enemy, we must pray for them. For the enemy that you pray for today could be the Christian that you share a pew with next Sunday. We need to step up when it comes to the hard lines. Whether we are new to the faith or have been a Christian for a long time, we can be better than we are. This is not as good as it gets. We can go further and deeper with God. Transformation comes when we allow God to change our thinking. Let us pray. Oh, Father, we thank you that you even desire to transform us into the image of your Son. What great love you have for us. We ask that you help us be willing to go through this transformation day by day. May we faithfully seek and serve you through your word, that we may stand on your promises. Help us to step up and pray for our enemies, yes, even ISIS, so that you may come, so that they may come to know you. In Christ's name and in his grace, we pray, amen. This is the word of God. It has the promises that we can stand on. Read it, study it, and let God transform you by the transforming of your mind. And pray for your enemies as an example of grace.